Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss how to develop a non-surgical treatment plan for patients with cervical spondylosis. This is an excerpt from a broader course on the non-surgical management of cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in seeing the broader course, we've left a link in the description. So now that we have talked about the different types of non-surgical treatment that we use with spondylosis, let's talk about how we would apply that to a specific patient. Now, once again, we'll talk about the symptom patterns that people with spondylosis may present with. They include the symptoms of cervical myelopathy, cervical radiculopathy, and neck pain. Now, once again, patients can have one, two, or all three of these symptom constellations. And when we think about patients, we're thinking about the full set of pattern, uh, patterns that they actually have when, when they first present to us. Now, if we just break this down, though, and think about the utility of all of the different modalities that we've talked about, let's first talk about cervical myelopathy. So here you can see cervical myelopathy, and if you expand that and think, what's the role of each of these, let's first talk about medications. So medications, as I mentioned with the natural history of cervical myelopathy, Cervical myelopathy tends to slowly progress. Medications will not change the course of that progression. What they can be useful for is addressing some of the symptoms of myelopathy. So people develop neuropathic like symptoms with burning or hypersensitivity or symptoms like that. Some of these nerve medications like gabapentin and Lyrica can be effective for it. Once again, it won't change the course of myelopathy, and certainly I wouldn't say that medications alone is an effective treatment for myelopathy, but it is a way of addressing some of the symptoms, and to that end, I would say medications are useful in this situation. The next thing to talk about will be physical and occupational therapy. So the role of PT and OT when people have myelopathy, you can think of it in two um, ways. The physical therapy can be certainly useful at addressing some of the hand dysfunction, the balance dysfunction, gait training, things like that, and maybe helping people manage the consequences of myelopathy a little bit more effectively by improving their balance, improving their strength, improving their dexterity over time. Once again, it won't typically have an immediate effect on myelopathy or its progression. Certainly neck strengthening exercises can't hurt because often when people have myelopathy, they have other issues with their cervical spine, so it can be useful in that situation as well. But once again, does not necessarily reverse or reduce the course of myelopathy itself. Having said that, I find it to be useful in the situation for myelopathy as well. Let's talk next about the role of injections when people have myelopathy. Now, if you remember, if you've seen in one of the other videos, myelopathy is a consequence of spinal cord compression to the point where people develop spinal cord dysfunction. Now, that means the spinal canal is very tight. Generally, most interventional pain management, neurologists, physiatrists, the people that are specialists that do injections will feel a little bit wary of doing injections in the setting of tight cervical stenosis. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I don't know that it's really that advisable if you have a very tight spinal cord and very tight spinal canal to put liquid into it as well. Uh, not that it carries a significant risk, but it certainly isn't going to do anything to open up the spinal canal. Now, if people with myelopathy also have radiculopathy or neck pain, there can be a role for injections in that situation. But here we're talking about specifically the utility of injections in somebody for myelopathy. And I don't really think that injections are advisable as it doesn't change the course of the myelopathy itself. Next, we'll talk about chiropractic care uh, and, uh, and osteopathic manipulative treatment. The question is, what's the role of that in the setting of myelopathy? As I mentioned in this section, I'm a fan of it. I certainly am a believer in chiropractic care. I've seen enough patients to know that people get benefit from it. Having said that, when there is tight stenosis, I have a little bit of a reservation as a spine surgeon, admittedly this is a bias, against high velocity manipulation. There are lots of different types of chiropractic treatment, and I don't think it's unreasonable to explore some of those, but because of the tight stenosis and the fact that myelopathy is progressive, it's not the first thing that I turn to, and I don't generally recommend it for my patients, specifically for myelopathy. Lastly, the alternative options. As I mentioned, these are emerging. Uh, well, acupuncture has been around for a long time, but it's something that I don't think is fully understood. I don't really know what to say to patients when they ask me, like, should I do acupuncture in the setting of myelopathy? 
I mean, I would say, sure, you can try it. I don't think there's danger in trying that stuff, but how much it really helps is a bit uh, remains to be seen. So when, when people ask me about it, I say, I don't really understand the utility of things like uh, mindfulness and uh, acupuncture and traction and yoga and things like that, specifically for myelopathy. So there, I would put a question mark. Next, let's talk about cervical radiculopathy. So cervical radiculopathy, as a reminder, is the symptoms people get from irritation of a cervical nerve. It can affect one or more nerves, and it typically causes pain, weakness, numbness, and tingling wherever that nerve goes. Now, in terms of the specific non-surgical options and their utility, we'll talk about them once again. We'll talk about all five. Medications. The role of medications for cervical radiculopathy is pretty powerful. Oral anti-inflammatories, whether it's in the form of steroids or NSAIDs, can be very useful for cervical radiculopathy. Again, the natural history of radiculopathy is to get better. So really, we're looking for temporizing things to manage the symptoms while they get better. In addition to anti-inflammatories, sometimes people can get relief from nerve medications like gabapentin and Lyrica. Certainly not unreasonable to try them. Most patients that I prescribe them to for cervical radiculopathy don't feel that it's worth it. They feel like there's too many side effects to justify the relief that they get. But having said that, there's no risk in trying it. So I tell people for medications, absolutely, I think there's utility for cervical radiculopathy. In terms of physical and occupational therapy, definitely I think there's utility as well. It can help for weakness, it can help with range of motion, it can certainly help with pain reduction, all of which I think are relevant in the setting of radiculopathy. So I definitely send people for PT and for OT as well on occasion. OT particularly if they have hand dysfunction, so C8 or T1 radiculopathies. So medications, PT, mainstay treatments I would argue. Injections are effective for radiculopathy as well. As I mentioned when I showed the diagrams, epidural and selective nerve root injections can be very effective for cooling off the nerve. Epidurals are effective because they can cover more than one nerve, especially if you have more than one nerve involved. So I will often send people for injections as well to a specialist who does those. In terms of chiropractic care and OMT, I find that patients get a fair amount of relief from them. It's not uncommon for people to have already seen a chiropractor before coming in to see me, uh, but if they haven't, I often encourage people to do it because I find it to be very effective for that. A lot of these interventions are partly managing the symptoms long enough to see if the symptoms will kind of get better as radiculopathy gets better on its own. So chiropractic care, very effective for it. And then alternative options, again, like acupuncture and yoga and Pilates and things like that, I think are certainly worth trying. I think some of those are more effective for lumbar pathology, but there's certainly no harm in trying those things for cervical disease as well. So any of these non-surgical options are very relevant in the setting of cervical radiculopathy. Now, the last section that we'll talk about is neck pain. Neck pain, again, as I mentioned in that earlier section, is such a widely variable problem. It can come from so many different things that it's hard to prescribe a specific course of treatment for it. And medications can definitely be helpful. And, and the medications that I find to be most useful are anti-inflammatories. Certainly, a nerve medications can help a little bit, especially if it's neck pain from nerve symptoms or radicular neck pain. Muscle relaxants can be very effective for this as well. And I don't find muscle relaxants to be useful for radiculopathy or myelopathy, but for neck pain, it can help quite a bit. So I often will use one or more muscle relaxants uh, uh, to help with the neck pain as well. Uh, and medications, I would say for sure, very effective for neck pain, and it's something that I use all the time. Physical therapy is a mainstay treatment for neck pain, and that is for neck strengthening, massage therapy, TENS unit, any of those modalities that I talked about before, seeing a really good physical therapist can be very effective at helping with neck pain. And so I use that systematically. In fact, I think you could argue that between PT, chiropractic care, and medications, those are mainstay treatments for neck pain alone. Surgery is usually not an effective solution for it. But so for PT and OT, check. I would definitely say that I use them. Injections can be effective. Um, sometimes epidural injections can help, but this is where that facet injection and radiofrequency ablation that I talked about in that section can be very effective. And so I send people to interventional pain people or interventional neurologists or physiatrists to help with those injections. I think they can be very effective for neck pain. It is another mainstay treatment for it. 
Chiropractic care and OMT is very effective for this as well. And there are different modalities for each of those that I think can be effective. I think seeing a very good chiropractor, starting treatment with them can help a lot with the neck pain. And so I definitely encourage people to do that. And then alternative options like acupuncture, again, I don't fully understand how it is effective for it, but it does seem to help a minority of patients, but help them a lot. And so I tell people trying acupuncture, trying yoga, Pilates, other types of integrative health things are all reasonable. It's certainly worth trying for neck pain. I generally tell people surgery is not effective, so we have to emphasize the non-surgical treatment options for that. Now, having said all of that, when I see a patient with cervical spondylosis, I start by thinking, what are the symptoms that they have? We break it down into myelopathy, radiculopathy, and neck pain, and depending on what is the most pressing issues and what we're really treating, we will come up with a plan that ideally would target all of those. So if we send people to, for injections, I'll say, listen, Mrs. Smith has neck pain and radicular symptoms and I think would benefit from these types of injections. But really understanding the role of each of those modalities is valuable when coming up with a treatment plan. Now, if somebody comes in with myelopathy that's rapidly progressive, whether or not they have radiculopathy or neck pain, that will become the driver of decision-making and timing. So thinking about your patient in aggregate, thinking about the symptoms that they have, helps dictate the timing and what types of non-surgical treatment you would employ. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.